In the physical world, objects like this painting, for example, are composed of things called matter. And the smallest unit of matter is an atom. So that means that this painting is composed of many atoms. In the physical world, that is. But what about in the world of computers? What about the virtual world? Well, in the virtual world, objects like this image file, for example, are composed of these little things called data. And the smallest unit of data is a bit. A bit is a binary digit that can take the value of either 0 or 1. And similar to how the painting in the physical world is composed of many atoms, the image file in the virtual world is composed of many bits. Now, contrary to the physical world, in the world of programming or the virtual world, you can obtain magical powers to duplicate, mutate, create, reshape, and the list goes on and on the objects within this world. And those magical powers come in the form of programs. And these programs are written in one of the various schools of magic called programming languages. A program can basically take in one or more of these virtual objects, like the image file for example, as input. And the incantations contained within that program using a particular school of magic or programming language can manipulate that object in pretty much any way that you desire. And that same program can then produce the manipulated object as its output. So how are these programs actually made? Now, although each programming language is its own school of magic, they're all pretty much capable of the same incantations or spells. And those spells can be described in a general sense like so. Now, before getting into each spell, let's briefly go over the way that a program is structured. That is, how are these spells organized to produce the overall program? So if we have our program here, and we can represent our input with this arrow and then our output with this arrow. We can just visualize that the data flows into our program and goes through our program and then out our program like so. And simply put, each spell provided by our programming language will be performed step by step like so. So if you imagine we get some input, like in our first example, the image file, that data flows into the application, and we have the power in each one of these steps to work with that data in any way that we please. So to explain this better, let's go ahead and use another example for our input. So let's say that we want to pass in a square to our program as our input and we'll actually represent that square as just the properties of the square. So we'll say the width of our square is two and the height, since it's a square, will also be two and we'll say the color is red. So this object will go into our program as the input and the spells provided by our programming language will be represented by each one of these lines. And after we perform all of these steps or cast all of these spells, we will output the square. And at that point, the square may or may not have been modified. So for example, maybe we just made the square larger. Now with an understanding of how our program will be performed step by step, we can now start getting into the abilities provided by the programming language. So we know that we have data flowing through our application, so now let's get into how we actually control the flow of that data through our application by using these magical lines of code. Basically, we can alter the flow of the data through our program based on some conditions. For example, we have our program here with the square as its input, and the program is basically just making the square larger. But maybe we only want to make red squares larger and blue squares we want to actually make smaller. So we'd have a line here that says something like if square is red and under that we'd say what to do if the square is red. So this means that if the square is red then multiply its width and height by 2. Or in other words double the size of the square. And we could also have another condition that says if square is blue, 
we'll divide the square by two, which will decrease the size of the square. So we can use conditionals to control the way that data flows through our program. And actually, since we only have instructions for when the square is red or when the square is blue, if the square is any other color, that piece of data just won't flow through the application. Now, currently we're only passing in one square as input to our program, but what if we pass in multiple squares? So we have six squares here that we're passing in as input to our program, both red and blue squares. So this brings us to another very powerful magical ability that our program language provides. So right now this program can only handle one square. So passing in multiple squares isn't really an option here. And when you think about the idea of handling multiple objects, you think that, oh, we can just handle them one at a time or cycle through each object and handle it individually. And the way that we do that within the program is by using a loop. And the way that a loop works is, let's consider all of these squares as one group of squares. So we'll just circle them to emphasize that they're a group. And we can actually name that group and we'll just call it squares. So now we can reference this entire group of squares by using just one name, squares. And we want to do something for each one of these squares. So what that would sort of look like is we would say for square, which is an individual square out of the group of squares. So we'll say for square in squares, which is this squares here that we're referencing. And under that, that's where we want to do something. So whatever's in this area here is what's going to happen to each square inside of squares. And this is a for loop. For every item in this group of items, we're going to do something here. So in our case, we want to do the same thing that we were already doing for individual squares for all of the squares. So we'd basically do for each square, one, two, three, four, five, six, for each square inside of squares, we want to do this. And that is how a for loop works. So instead of having this code here, we could actually just take this whole group here and put that inside of our program. And this is how we would handle multiple items going into our program. So as you can see here, we're able to handle multiple squares, both red and blue. And when they go through our program, we're going to cycle through each square in this group of squares. And then we're going to check if it's red or check if it's blue. And depending on which color it is, we're either going to make it larger or smaller. Now, the last magical ability that we are going to go over is the ability to group instructions into a single instruction. So let's imagine that for both red and blue squares, we don't want the size of the square to either exceed 10 or go below one. So since this constraint is shared between both red and blue squares, we don't want to have to write the code twice. For example, we don't want to do this. So let's make some space here. So we don't want to have to write this twice like so. So as you can see here, under each if statement, we're having to check the same thing on both of these. So this is duplicate code, but programming languages give us another magical power that allows us to avoid writing this duplicate code. So we can actually extract this into one instruction. So we can call this instruction something like validate square. And we'll just put it here, validate square. And we'll just put some brackets here to group this into one instruction. And now we'd be able to take this instruction and just put it in here. And then here, we would just be able to say validate square. And the same goes for here. We would just be able to say validate square. And this would be somewhere in the file actually. So as you can see here, when we do validate square, we're actually doing the code that's in here. And since 
The same thing that needs to be done here needs to be done on both blue and red squares. We can just extract that code to a separate section and give it a name and we can just allow both red and blue if conditions to call that validate square. And of course, at this point, our output would depend entirely on what color square is the input to our program. And with this understanding of how programs are structured and how they work, you're now ready to move on to learning your first programming language. So that's going to be it for this video. If you found it helpful, please don't forget to leave a like. And if you're interested in more content like this, go ahead and subscribe as well. And I'll see you in the next one.